After my water simulation video, I had a few people ask me how to implement buoyancy in Godot. In this video, we'll cover how to make objects float and how to sync it up with waves from a shader. Before we get started, I have a scene set up with a plain mesh instance at 000 to represent the water. Other than a nice shader, there's nothing else going on here. Let's start by adding a new rigid body 3D node. Add a mesh renderer 3D node as a child to it and give it a cube mesh. Then add a collision shape 3D node and make it a box shape. Give the rigid body node a good name and let's add a script to it. Let's add some variables at the top to hold some values we'll need. First export a float for the floating force, appropriate name. Let's also grab the gravity from the project settings and save it into a variable. Finally, let's set a const for the water height. This is essentially the y position of our water mesh transform, which is currently a zero. Now, in the physics process function, let's calculate the depth of the rigid body. We get this by taking the water height and taking away the y position of our rigid body. If the depth is greater than zero, then the object can be considered submerged and we can start applying the buoyancy force. For now, let's use apply central force to actually apply the force. The force calculation is the up vector multiplied by the float force value, gravity and depth. Multiplying by depth will allow us to make the force stronger the deeper the object is underwater and weaker the closer it is to the surface. It's not required but I find it just helps a little bit. If we run it now, the cube will sink and float back to the surface. Something doesn't seem quite right though. Water is denser than air, so the object should feel some extra drag while moving through it. Let's fix that now. Add two new variables at the top, one for linear drag and one for angular drag while submerged. Speaking of which, let's also add a boolean variable to keep track of if the object is submerged or not. Override the integrate forces method. If the object is submerged, multiply the linear and angular velocities by 1 minus their respective drag values. We do a 1 minus so that 0 means no drag and 1 means maximum drag. If you're wondering why we're doing this in integrate forces and not in the physics process function, the docs state that physics may run on a separate thread and different levels of granularity, so we should set our velocities here. Finally, if the depth is greater than 0, let's set submerged to true and false if not. Now if we tweak the force and drag some, we should get a convincing buoyancy effect. This works fantastic if we have flat water, but usually water has waves. If we switch the waves on in this water shader, we'll quickly see the effect no longer looks right. We're going to have to alter our depth calculation to go from the actual height of the waves. There's a couple of ways we can do this, like using a compute shader, but in our case it will be simpler to recreate the vertex offset logic within GDScript. Taking a look at our shader's vertex function, the logic is pretty simple. It's getting the world position of the vertex, calculating a height value by sampling a noise texture parameter and then offsetting the y value of the vertex. This calculation won't be too hard to copy in a script. We're going to attach a script to our warp mesh and create some variables at the top of that we'll need to calculate the height. Then in ready, we'll get the values directly from the shader. Before we start recreating our calculation, we'll have to make a small change to the shader first. The shader uses the built-in time variable to offset the noise texture. We need this time value to be synced between GD script on the CPU and the shader on the GPU. An easy and simple way to do this is to track time in GD script and set a new wave time parameter in the shader. Now that we've sorted that out, let's create a method called getHeight that will take in a world position vector and return a float for the height at that location. We can then use the same calculation from the shader to calculate the x and y position we need in UV space. UV coordinates are always between 0 and 1, so we'll use the wrap function so that we never exceed those values. We can then multiply the UV values by the width and height of the noise texture to get our pixel coordinates. Then finally, we'll use the getPixel function on the noise image to get our value. Now let's make use of our new function. Back in the cube script, get a reference to the water node instead of using our water height const in our depth calculation, plumb in the get height call using the cube's world position instead and voila! The cube now bobs up and down with the waves. It currently only works if the water mesh is placed exactly at zero on the y axis though, so let's fix that quickly by adding our water's y position to the get height return value. Buoyancy like this is great for small symmetrical objects like balls, but with wider flat objects you can soon see it doesn't look right. 
it's not rotating at all as the waves move underneath it. A nice way to solve this is, instead of applying the force directly to the centre of the object, we can create some nodes to act as probes. We'll check the depth for each one of these nodes positions and apply the force there. Start by creating a node 3D child to act as a container for our probes. Then add some children nodes to be the probes themselves. Here I'm using marker 3D nodes as they show up in the editor. I'm using 9 probes spread out across the flat box and I'm going to move them to just below the surface of the box so it helps stay above the waves. Then in our script create a variable called probes. This variable will hold the children of our probe container. Then in the physics process function, before we calculate our depth, add a for loop to iterate over the probes. Let's indent everything below this so it takes place within the loop. For our depth calculation, change global position to be p.globalPosition. Now let's change how we apply force. Instead of using apply central force, let's use just apply force instead. Our calculation for the force remains the same, but now we need to give it a position to apply the force to. The documentation states that the position is the offset from the body origin in global coordinates. This might sound a bit confusing at first, but all we have to do to get this is to take our global position of the probe and subtract the object's global position, and we're done. Because we're applying force multiple times now, we'll have to lower our force value some. I find 1.4 seems to work nicely here. You can also play around with removing the depth multiplication from the force calculation. It works better when objects are fully submerged, but I find it's much more harder to try and dial in the right float force. I think that just about does it for this video. I hope you found this useful. I'll leave a GitHub link to the project files in the description below. If you have any suggestions for topics you'd like covered, please leave them in the comments and I'll see what I can do. So please like, subscribe and all that stuff to help the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!